Hi, I'm Dr. Craig Goodmurphy, and welcome to this episode of Ultrasound Bites at EVMS. This time we'll be talking about the sub-xiphoid or sub-costal view in a cardiac scan. What are our objectives for today? Well, we want to introduce you to some of the clinical applications uh, used in point-of-care ultrasound for this view. We want to talk to you about how you set up the machine and some of the options that you have when you're doing that. We'll give you the patient setup and acquiring some of the acoustic windows that you'll need to find and how to adjust those images um, based on probe movements. Then we'll come back to some pitfalls and pearls that may help you as you in interact with different patients and body habitus along the way. And then finally, we'll talk about a scan card. The scan cards are going to be there available on Blackboard and those will help you as little reminders that you can print out uh, to take into the clinic with you and remind yourself of what it takes to require or to practice this particular view and archive an appropriate clinically relevant image for part of your portfolio as we work towards the um, badging curriculum at Eastern Virginia Medical School. So what's the application for sub xiphoid or subcostal views. Well, in this particular view, you can see the probe would be touching the skin. It's touching right where you'd think it would based on the name. It's either in the midline, which was why it's called a sub xiphoid view, or it may be slightly off midline, but it tends to be under the costal margin, which is why it's called a subcostal view. It's using in either of those cases the liver as an acoustic window. And in doing so, it gets an oblique view of the four chambers of the heart so that you can assess all four chamber functions. So you may wanna be looking at the function of the four chambers. You may wanna be looking at the function of the valves or the squeeze. Uh, you can even see the aortic outflow or the pulmonary trunk outflow in these views with a slight adjustment. And you can see the connection to the lungs with the pulmonary veins. So we want to evaluate the anatomy of the four chambers and see if there's any pericardial effusions as a potential. Maybe even see if the squeeze is affected as we said earlier. So there's multiple things. One of the ones we're focusing on here at EVMS is to make sure that there's not this deadly collection of fluid in the pericardial sac, which could lead to a cardiac tamponade. And that essentially would squeeze the heart into the non-compressible fluid sac and eventually stop the heart, which would lead to, of course, death. So if you have a difficult patient with a particular body habitus or rib uh, spacing that allows for a very difficult window in some of the other views, this can also be a go-to. The other thing that this can be handy for is if you're trying to do compressions on the heart, maybe during a cardiac resuscitation, you can have someone applying compressions or a machine applying compressions to the thoracic cage and the probe is actually out of the way with this sub xiphoid or subcostal view. So you can actually see if those compressions are effective while you're marching through the hospital, especially with a handheld where you're not cord bound. It also can remove some of the rib interference. So sometimes they will be difficult based on the tall, skinny people with a long thoracic cage. They can oftentimes have very tight rib spaces, especially as we get down lower to see the apical components. And uh, you might wanna try this because it gets rid of some of that rib interference. So let's think about a couple other things that this will be allowed for. So if we're looking at the subcostal window, Let's look at a couple of videos that we have here. First, we can see that this particular window has some bradyca uh, bradycardia going on, a very fast heart rate. And in this particular window, when we look at the view, we can see the liver up here at the top of the screen. We can see this wedge shape that tells us we're using a phased array probe. We can see that the probe marker is to the right of the screen, which would be the left side of the patient, which is why we would see the apex on this side and the right side of the heart and liver on this side. It's got a body mark indicator here to show that the probe marker is to the left and it's got plus signs for nipples. 
Here you can see a pericardial effusion in this particular person. So you're not getting a great view of the chambers particularly. We would want to try to clean that up, but it's given you the diagnostic window that you need to say this person's in trouble and has fluid accumulating in the pericardial cavity and why would be your next indication. Let's look at those one more time before we move on and why this clinical pathology from this subcostal window can be helpful. Notice that this heart is not struggling yet. It has not gone into tamponade yet, but you can start to see the anterior wall of the right ventricle starting to struggle and do what's called trampolining. As it starts to push against the pressure buildup in this component, it's compressing this low pressure chamber of the right heart um, and it's starting to struggle. On this uh, one to the left side of the screen, there's all sorts of reasons that this person may have uh, increased heart rate, and you can't really diagnose what's going on from this particular one, but it gives you a nice shot of the valves in which you can see the orientation of the chambers. Let's look at a particular part of that. So first of all, we can see the right ventricle is here, the right atrium is here, and we can follow the IBC right into the liver from the hepatic veins. We can see that the left ventricle to the left side of the body would be just off the screen, which is why we have an oblique view. And then the mitral valve is fluttering just over here, which would separate it from the left atrium, which we're getting some artifact in from some reverberation, probably from the diaphragm, maybe a mirroring artifact. And here we can see coming off to the side, the pulmonary veins that would be coming into this left atrium. Watch carefully one more time. We do not see the aorta, which will oftentimes appear here if you're too anterior on your view, in which case that can be called a five-chambered view. Let's move on. Here's one from Ultrasound Idiots. This is another website that's available for people at EVMS run by one of our ER faculty, and that one showed somebody in tamponade. So here you'll see the trampolining that will start to occur over this wall of the right ventricle. Look at how the heart is starting to trampoline as this person's heading into tamponade. Now let's look at how we're going to use some machine setup. First of all, we're going to be showing you on the keyboard that's associated with the MindRay 7, and we're going to be going into the patient information to show you what you're going to put in there. We're going to be going into the presets to show you what we're going to be doing there, and then we're going to look at the uh, screen as we move through some of those things. So we're going to come over to the machine, which we're going to start looking at the buttons to see the knobs that we're going to be using. And we're going to do that by coming into a preview window in a picture in picture. There we go. Now we're looking at the screen of the MindRay 7 and we're going to be using the patient information button seen right here. That brings up this particular screen and we're going to ask you to enter the patient information as instructed in Blackboard. It may vary depending on which course you're in, which program you're in, and which year we're in as we refine the curriculum forward. But it's very important to bring that information with you. It also should be available in your image submission instructions. So typically this will be what module? It may be Thorax 1. Then you can roll over into this area to highlight it. And in the first patient name, you're going to put um, your program and year. Perhaps it's MPA 2024. And then that's pretty much all you need. Make sure that it's auto-generating the ID. And this is an important thing for us when we're grading it, and that it will show you uh, when it was graded, which machine it was on, and as you use set to come in and click over the OK button, that's your mouse cursor, now you can see that this information, Thorax 1, MPA 2024, auto-created auto ID, which station it was at, 
the date and the time at which it was acquired. This all helps validate that you have done this task on your own with your name and ID on it, which you will put at the side of the screen off the image and which view you're looking at, which might be sub xiphoid or it might be a parasternal long axis or it might be an apical four depending on which, which uh, module you're in. Okay? This particular one would be sub xiphoid. So we would have our name and ID. We hit for that comments, which is going to be the ABC. Whoops. Hit the wrong one. What I hit here was exam, and this is what we want to go into as well. We can see that we're in adult cardiac setting on this exam button. We could be in a difficult cardiac setting if the body habitus was making that a little more difficult shot. And you could actually even be in EM fast. The EM fast will change some of the presets, and we'll come back to that when we're talking about our SPI uh, pearl. So we're picking adult cardiac, and then we go exit with our set button. Now as we look at the screen, we have adult cardiac. Notice how the M in the uh, mind ray is off to the left side of the screen. This means that everything on this leading edge is going to be our patient's left side. And this side would be the patient's right side. If we go into EM fast by going exam, EM fast, Notice how it says EM fast up top, the marker has switched sides. Now the M and the probe marker should be to the patient's right, which would mean that this leading edge would be the patient's right side. And this receding edge would be the patient's left side of their body. So it's important to understand the presets so that you actually understand what you're getting and what compromises you're making. We'll show you more about this a little bit later. Let's go back with exam to adult cardiac, set, make, wait for it to update, and we're ready to start scanning. But before we do, let's go back to our PowerPoint. So we've entered our patient information as instructed in Blackboard. We've selected the appropriate probe and the appropriate preset, which is a phased array for this particular one. We have left our depth, gain, and focal zone as they are until we start scanning. And then we're going to worry about our TGCs, which may need a slight reverse slope in some people, or it may need a, a positive slope. What does that mean? Let's look at our screen again as we go to picture in picture. And we could see that this particular machine has a fairly centered TGC down the side, time gain compensation. So it may need this kind of positive slope, but because the cardiac window can be so fluid filled, it may be overwhelmed in the far field by posterior acoustic enhancement, in which case you might want to start to adjust these. But as you start scanning, let's keep them down the line and get in the habit of adjusting them once you start scanning. Remember, these are very important buttons because they are one, some of the only buttons that will not be a changed when you go back to a preset. These are physical knobs that must be manually controlled and you therefore want to get in the habit of knowing whether your machine has them, knowing whether they can be adjusted, and making sure you as the clinician do so. Now let's think about patient positioning. For this we're going to go back to our patient on our bed and here we can see our patient. Let's zoom out a little bit and see what our patient is up to. How are you doing, Atif? Whoa, that's the wrong way. <laughs> Here we can see Atif is laying on his back. Here we can see that our presets on our marker are going to be in cardiac mode with the probe marker to the patient's left or a probe marker in a long axis to the patient's head. If we were in eFast or some other setting, we would watch the screen and make sure that we are following convention for that, which would mean our probe marker to be the patient's right or to the patient's head. Really, when you're in cardiac, we want to make sure we're to the left, which is going to be to this side. Okay? We can have our patient positioned 
and we're going to be using our fanning, which will move the tail of the probe towards their head in a more upright and vertical position, and we're going to drop it down towards their belly. Notice how my hand gets in the road if I'm holding it as I typically would. This may be the time to switch your hand around and actually hold the probe more like this. Notice how I lay it past my fingers so that I can feel their xiphoid process when I'm touching them. And I know that I'm not digging into them. And the other thing it helps me do is get my hand out of my own way so I can actually lay the probe right down to the patient's abdomen. And the third thing it allows me to do is actually pile gel up into this space so that it doesn't splooch, is that a word? I don't know, splooch all over their body and I can maintain good contact with the patient even though I might have some fairly robust fanning movements during this particular scan. The pivot that we're going to use is going to help us to align the cardiac chambers and valves a little bit better by getting the actual axis of this patient's heart in line. And then finally, when we use heel-toe movements, the heel-toe movements will tend to help center the image and align things in the midline. Now when we think about the patient themselves, we have our patient curly, currently in the supine position. If we wanted to, we could get him to raise his arm above his head on his left side, and we could get him to roll onto his left side in order to bring the thoracic wall, wall and the heart closer together using gravity. And that would be called a left lateral decubitus position, LLD or LLDP, depending on if you're including the word position or not. When we acquire the acoustic window, as was mentioned earlier, we can be directly sub-xiphoid, or we may scan off to the sides, one way or the other, depending on the axis of this particular patient's heart. And we are, our goal is to get a nice, beautiful view, like we can see in the PowerPoint here, of all four chambers and both valves deep enough to see the pericardium, which is seen right here, all the way along the anterior edge of the liver and even along the posterior wall and the left side here. We can see the left atrium, the right atrium, and notice the interatrial septum between the two. Notice how this has a grayscale value. It's also important to be deep enough to see the pulmonary veins as they enter into the left atrium, the transverse running veins that you can see on both sides. Also, we can see the interventricular septum. Notice how there's a little bit of dropout right before it comes to the atrioventricular septum between the two. This is artifact. But we can see the valves associated with the right side of the heart, the tricuspid, and we can see the mitral valve. We can even see a papillary muscle in the left side, and we can see the moderator band in the right side coming across from the interventricular septum to the base of the anterior papillary muscle where our conduction system is working. And if this is affected, you may not see good movement at this particular space. So we want to make sure that is this a real thing or is this artifact? We can also see our acoustic window beautifully, which is our liver. Notice how the apex is not fully visible in this view, which is why you might want to opt for a apical four chamber if you really need to see if there's a thrombus inside that apex of the left ventricle. So, getting going, the average person is going to need a shot because we're coming from the abdomen of about 15 to 25 centimeters deep, depending on where, uh, where their body habitus falls. You want to definitely be deep enough to see those pulmonary veins and the pericardium. Arteries, aorta and pulmonary artery, are going to be more anterior as your probe is more vertical against the patient. So when we're scanning like this, we're seeing deeper into the patient. When we lay down towards their abdomen, we're coming more anterior. Arteries, I would see in this position, veins, I'll need to bring it up depending on that particular individual because remember the left atrium is the deepest part 
of that apical tri of that triangle known as the heart. We're going to start in the midline and have our a marker to the left since we're in an adult cardiac view and not EFAST. And then we're going to drop our probe into the scan. We start vertical, at least I like to start vertical because I know I have to drop into the scan to fan through the heart and up into the thorax. Right now I'd be looking at the uh, proximal abdomen. As I drop into the probe, by dropping the tail of the probe, I'm dropping into the thoracic scanning by shooting up towards the patient's head. A Couple other things. Unlike most of our other cardiac scans, we're scanning in the thorax with those. We want the patient to breathe out to rid the air artifacts that can show up with an overinflated lung and open the window. But since we're scanning from the abdomen, we actually want the patient to breathe in, not out, because that will drop their diaphragm and bring the heart closer to our probe in, in that actual proximal uh, foregut position. We're going to use pivot and heel toe with small movements to try to refine the image. Let's go to our patient now. We'll hit two. And then we'll go back to window in, or picture in picture. And I'm going to show you the screen, uh, the patient on this particular one. There we go. And now we can lay our probe. Our position, patient is in position. We're going to add a little bit more gel, even though we've already got some on from the demo portion. Because you can never have enough gel. That's one question you should always say yes to. Do, you, do I need more gel? Why, yes, I do. I'm holding the probe in a reverse position with the gel in between my fingers and the probe so I don't dig into the patient and I can at least be cognizant of how much pressure I'm putting into them and to maintain the probe itself. When I put this probe on in vertical, I can actually see liver. And I'm going to slide just off the midline to the subxiphoid region and I can actually see all of these hepatic vessels coming right back into the IVC. And we can see here hepatic vessels coming right back into the IVC, which is piercing the diaphragm, and then going right into the right atrium. Now, if we get our patient to take their breath in this time, notice how the cardiac window starts to open up. We're going to overgain things just a little bit because it transfers better onto the TV, even though on the screen here it looks pretty good. We're going to decrease our depth by adding depth. And our patient, now we can see all four chambers. One, right atrium, left atrium, left ventricle, and the right atrium, our right ventricle is right here. We are not seeing the tricuspid valve though. We're actually just seeing movement of the atrioventricular wall. That is not there. We can see valve movement. Notice how it opens up. I'm going to overgain that a little bit so it shows up a little bit better. But now that's, that's atrioventricular wall. There we can actually see valve movement. And breathe when you need to, please. And this will require a little bit of fine tuning. For this particular patient, I'm going to heel toe, which is centering or not centering based on their axis. And then I'm going to fan more vertical, looking more posterior towards the IVC. And as I drop more anterior, I'm dropping the probe towards the abdomen of the patient. And we're going to get them to take a breath in again. And now we can see, oh, we had a little flutter there. Now we can see that we've actually got a mitral valve between the left ventricle up top, or more anterior, and the left atrium, more posterior. And we can see our pericardium here. Notice how we don't have a lot of liver in this particular view. This can be difficult if their patient has uh, got a lot of air in their bowel or in their stomach. Because we're not using the liver as a big acoustic window, it may be a difficult shot for people such as our patient today who has a fairly small left lobe of the liver. So what can we do to refine it? We can actually use a better window by dropping down into the abdomen a little bit more and using a little bit better liver 
window to the right of that xiphoid process, which is why it's okay to call it a uh, subcostal as well. Now we can see a little bit more left uh, window as our acoustic, but we have to shoot a little deeper. And breath in. And there we can start to see the chambers again. Again, I'm going to overgain a little bit in order to show better on the TV. Too much there. Notice we don't want banding when we're using our TGCs. We don't want something across that's really dark or really light compared to everything else. We want a nice even gradient where anechoic structures like fluid should be anechoic. We've got to make sure things are real. There's our hepatic vessels right into the right, vent right atrium. And breath in, please. And now our windows come into view. We can refine that with some pivoting to see the valves. We may not be able to get all the valves in one single shot because this is a dynamic scan. You may have to chase one valve and then the other, but your job as the clinician in training is to make sure that you've seen those valves, you've inspected them, you've inspected the chambers, you've looked for anything odd, and you've cleared them of having pericardial effusion between the liver and the heart anterior wall or posterior wall. And what we can see from here is that we've used these refining movements to open up our acoustic window from patient to patient. Let's think about some scanning pitfalls and pearls. So we'll review a couple pitfalls that you can get into. One, the small left lobe of the liver can make it difficult to scan this image in some folks because it allows the stomach or the transverse colon to take up that space where the liver isn't and can give you air artifacts that can make this in a difficult uh, scan. Having a very narrow, long thoracic cage can actually push this into being a very deep shot in some people, which when you go deeper, you're going to lose resolution. So those deeper structures like the left atrium can be difficult to make out. Gas in a transverse colon or stomach, even if they do have a good lobe of the liver, can get in your way. And you may need to manipulate your patient in order to help remove some of that. Even by doing some probe massaging, you can push some of that out of the way. If you turn the patient into the left lateral decubitus position, think about what happens to air with gravity. It should roll up to the right side more and get out of your way a little bit more. But if it's in the stomach, that may not help. Some people will be extremely sensitive to the push on this particular one. Even though they'll feel like it's pushing on their ribs and you know you might not be, they can still be sensitive. And one of the anatomical thoughts that I have behind that is that the attack angle of the fibers of the diaphragm on some people, especially tall folks I've noticed, can actually be pulled at when you're pushing on their abdominal wall, it's, it's really bothering their diaphragm, which is pulling on their ribs and creates the pain associated with it, even though you're not pushing on the ribs. But sometimes, and I've seen this happen, pushing harder doesn't make the image better. Gentle probe manipulation, some reasonable pressure, and warning your patient that this can be a little bit uncomfortable for some people are all good habits to get into. Make sure you can see the actual valves and not simply the AV septum movements that are in the shot. You must see an opening. If you're not sure, put on color Doppler and see that there's actually flow going through those valves rather than just movement. And then some pearls that can help you along the way. Slide to the right of the liver to help open the acoustic window in some folks, especially when they have a small left lobe. Partial breaths in may be enough in some people. You don't need a massive breath in, although that will pull the heart closer to you. It may overextend uh, the view in some folks and actually drop the anterior edge of their lungs into the shot and you'll actually get lung interfering with your window. Small movements are king to refining this shot. Pivots will refine the opening of the chambers and the valves. Heel toe tend to center your images more. Don't bog down on this view. We're teaching you three different cardiac views because they're useful. You can time out and take a long time getting an image that will never get refined in that person. So if they have a parasternal long axis that's really hard, slip into the subxiphoid. If they're really gassy that day or they've got a tough subxiphoid, 
get back to that parasternal long axis. If both of those are bad, go to the little bit more difficult, but also a very important shot, which is that apical four chamber. All sorts of ways that you can increase your confidence and it takes scanning, scanning, scanning. So some of the artifacts that you're gonna see here are the common ones that we've run into before. Reverberation, you'll oftentimes see from valves or from the septa and the pericardia. These fibrous tissues tend to have good reflectors, maybe even from the diaphragm as we saw in our patient today. Posterior acoustic enhancement could become overbearing in the far field and make the far field look over gains because all of the heart is filled with fluid, therefore it all becomes quite uh, enhanced through posterior acoustic enhancement. Posterior acoustic shadowing can happen, especially with these fibrous layers. Some of the valves as they move can create that. The diaphragm can create some of that. And the connective tissues and the angles of attack will sometimes create dropout, as we saw in the intraventricular septum of our patient today. Dirty shadowing from air, either in the stomach or the transverse colon, or if they overbreathe, uh, sometimes the anterior edge of the lungs can create that dirty shadow, which will get a very quick attenuation and a terrible image. Uh, so try half breaths or partial breaths and tell the person, the patient, communicate with them often and frequently to make sure that they understand what a good uh, position is. So when they breathe in, maybe breathe in slowly, slowly, perfect, hold it there versus big breath in every time. So as far as the labeling, we really want to make sure you follow the Blackboard instructions because they can vary slightly from program to program or even from year to year. In general, though, under patient last name, you'll put in the session. In the first name, you'll put in your program and typically the year of graduation. And in the portion off of the image, in the black portion, you're going to put your last name, first initial, student ID, because there is no such thing as anonymous scanning, especially in clinic, but here at EVMS as well. And then you're going to label the image you're trying to acquire, which would be in this case subxiphoid. You can use short forms, but use them well. And you have to label some things. In some of these, it might involve four chambers. It might involve the valves. It might involve picking out some of those specific artifacts so that we know that you're learning the things you need to do and the things you need to find to interpret these images as a great clinician that we know you're striving to be. It takes practice to master your craft. Let's think about some SPI pearls. We talked about the presets and the effects on resolution. Let's think about the things we've talked about before, which is temporal resolution versus grayscale resolution. Remember, temporal resolution refers to time-based resolution. Grayscale resolution refers to the uh, bits that are available for the image and how many grayscales that you want to look at. The more grayscales you have, the prettier the anatomy shot, but you're bogging down that 77 thousand formula by asking it to do lots of grayscale pretty and you might lose temporal resolution. So in cardiac scanning they tend to be less grayscales, more black and white um, in order to increase the opportunity for proper time resolution. And that's real-time scanning is what we call it. But anything that we're seeing can be real-time, which has been said before. So if it's not correct real-time, you have to make sure that you don't overinterpret it just because you've bogged down the machine with too many focal points or too much grayscale for what you're trying to accomplish. In the cardiac scan, we're looking for um, moving reflectors, valves, cardiac wall movements we need to make sure that real time actually is real time. And that pause that we see in the valve is not because our computer is bogged down, but it's a pause that we can see that's real. And we saw one of those on our patient today too. Very normal to have a few of those, and, but if they're excessively long or excessively common, then you might consider that there is a real issue going on and not just a common uh, pause once in a while. Consider how long it will take to make the adjustments when you have presets. I know that sometimes you will be literally in the fast mode trying to get a decision and diagnosis at the bedside, which is the, one of the strengths of using ultrasound as a tool in your clinical acumen. But your job is to get the best images in the shortest time possible to acquire the best diagnostic image you can and interpret it dynamically 
So if it doesn't compromise patient safety, consider changing the knobs in the machine settings to make sure you're getting that best image possible. Let's go back to our machine so we can show you a couple of the things that happen between adult cardiac and we'll pull up, uh, this is two, and we're going to pull up our picture in picture and we're going to go to our screen, I got that. Here's our um, keyboard that we're seeing. Again, I'm sorry I asked you to clean up already, but I'm going to goop you again. Anytime for you, Dr. Murphy. You're the best. Okay, we've got our probe in position. We're going to lay it on to our patient, and we're just going to get a view of the liver because the grayscales are nice here, and we can see this beautiful hepatic vessels coming back into the IVC. If we got our patient to take a breath in, we would be right into our sub shot. And we can see that with a little refinement, we can see our mitral valve in our left side. Turn the gain up just a little bit extra to see that movement, and it's actually opening. We can put color on and pull our gain down now until it's gone, and then just add it back a little bit. So we can see that there's actual flow through that valve. We're going to turn color off. And now what we're going to do is we're keeping this nice image here. We've got good gray scales, but not as many as we would see in adult abdomen. Let's switch our settings by going exam. Let's go to EM fast, which is a compromise setting. We're not getting great thorax and we're not getting great abdomen. And notice how the image has switched because I had my probe marker to the left and here we can see in EM fast that the probe marker is to the right. So the anatomy is still the same. This person has not flipped their heart around, but what we can see is that we would have to change our probe in order to get the properly interpreted image for the cardiac setting. So that's one of the things that changes with preset. Where is your probe marker? There's, not a, there's a little bit more grayscale in this one, so we actually see a lot more filling of the right ventricle as a result of having more grays. So we would have to adjust our image a little bit and maybe pull down our overall gains. We would want to think about our focal point as we move our position. What's our point of interest? Typically it's going to be our pericardium, the deepest structure in the point of interest. But if it was a valve for a moment, because we wanted to zoom in on a valve, then we would move our uh, our uh, probe or focus position up to the bottom of that valve region. All right, our patient is just breathing comfortably whenever they need to. And now I'm going to ask them to take a partial breath in. And perfect. Now we can see that valve beautifully on the mitral valve side. We'd have to go after the tricuspid and pull down a little bit more of this artifact. Notice how there is a mirroring artifact from the diaphragm coming across the heart. This is not real. All right, now let's go now to adult abdomen. And we'll put some focal points on this and start to bog down. Whoops. We're going to go to exam, adult abdomen, which has a default setting of having a lot of good grays. The probe markers on the same side. We can adjust our gain again. And you can see that now the valve seems to pause a little bit more often, especially if I start to add a focus number increase to this. I've added three, four focal points to this particular image. And look at how our image is struggling to process. Now, I would not want to interpret that he has cardiac problems and start him along a pathway of all sorts of crazy tests and financial burdens that the patient would bear because I haven't run my machine correctly and I've misinterpreted a poorly set up machine and created a chain of events that have caused this patient financial stress, um, decision stress as they're going for cardiac exams and they're not sure if they're healthy simply because you didn't understand the physics and the setup of what you're getting when you set your presets. All right, thank you to our patient. We'll let you clean up one more and one last time. Let's go back to our headshot here. 
we're going to come in and we're going to show you in, in part four. If we go to four, we'll come back to our computer and we can see that we would have our scanning cards, which we'll uh, have on Blackboard for you, and you can print these out as you go to clinic, that will show you the subcardiac or subxiphoid view and the things that you need to remember as you're setting this up. I'm Dr. Craig Goodmurphy. Thank you for joining us on Ultrasound Bites at EVMS. We'll see you next time.